Good morning, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We want to say welcome to virtual worship this morning, and we are so uh, excited that you joined us today. We are elephant elated, and Hippopotamus happy to have you with us. We know that you could have been anywhere else at 11 o'clock. Uh, on a Sunday morning, but here you are with Belfair Church, and we're excited to have you. Uh, this morning, I'm looking forward to worship. Uh, Kim is going to lead us in just a moment in, uh, in a couple of songs, and uh, then following that, Elder Jeremy Johnson is going to share God's Word with us today, and I am so looking forward uh, to sitting back hearing God's Word preached today, and I pray that you are too. And so in just a moment, Kim is going to lead us in worship, followed by a message, and then I'll come back before you at that time.
Continue to, to be with us, Father. Lead us, guide us, and protect us, Father. We know that there's so much going on in this country, in this world, Father, but we know that you have the ultimate say-so. And so we ask that you just continue to let your, your will and your way and your plan manifest itself, Father. And so this morning, as we, as we get ready to, to go into your word, Father, I just ask that you allow the words that, that I, I say, Father, fall into good soil, Father, so they can produce much fruit. Love you and we thank you for everything that you've done for us, Father, and everything that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning I'll be preaching from the, the book of Romans, chapter 8, uh, verses 31 through 39. And this morning I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, and in your word, in your Bibles, you'll find these similar words. What then shall we say to these things? God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake were you being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So this morning I'd like to, to preach from the, the topic, Victory Secured. Gro growing up, uh, my mother would always watch the TV show Matlock. And, and season after season, and, and episode after episode, I would sit and I would watch Andy Griffith defend these, these characters. And, and one thing I began to notice about this fictional TV lawyer is that no matter the case, no matter the defendant, whether it was a, a recently widowed wife who had been accused of killing her husband, or, or some city politician who had been accused, accused of taking out his, his opponent, no matter the circumstances of the case, Matlock would always win. And after seeing this often, I began to, to, to shift how I watched the show and my vantage point changed. And so I would, I would go from watching the episodes and, and thinking, I wonder if Matlock is gonna win the case today. And I began to look at it and say to myself, man, this episode is pretty bad, but let's just wait and see how Matlock's gonna figure it out because we know he's gonna win. And so with that in mind, to, today we find our footing in the book of Romans. And so Paul pens this epistle to the Christians living in Rome, and though he had not visited them there yet, it's been said that he did admire their faith and that he prayed for them regularly. And so when he, when he writes this epistle to them, he's talking from the overarching thing of righteousness in God and how it should take its place in our daily lives. And so when we look at the book of Romans and we see that he's teaching from this overarching theme, we see that Paul wanted the Christians in Rome to not only understand the, this, this theological concept of, of righteousness and what it means, but how they're to live their lives with it and how it has a place and a purpose in their life. And so he spends the first three chapters of this book telling how we all need righteousness because we're all condemned. And as believers, we know that there's no condemnation because we share the righteousness of God and therefore the law cannot condemn us. Then he spends the next two chapters 
talking about the provisions of God's righteousness, or, or more plainly, it said that we've all been justified by faith and how God has provided salvation through Jesus Christ. And so what we as believers today can grasp from that is, is that there is no obligation for us to our old selves because we have the Spirit of God who enables us now to overcome the flesh and live with God. And so then we look at chapters 6 through 8, and then he turns and he begins to talk about how, how righteousness is accomplished in our lives. And that those of us who believe are wholly identified with the death and resurrection of Jesus, and therefore we should live our life new in Christ Jesus. And what that means for us today is that there's no frustration or we shouldn't have any frustrations about the problems of today because we share the glory of God and the blessed hope of Christ's return. And so it's at that last point where we find ourselves in today's sermon. So you see, because of the persecution that the Christians in, in Rome were going through, both physical and, and spiritual, they were looking for a, a, a revival because they needed to survive. And so these hardships caused them to wonder if their newfound faith would be defeated. And so in the latter part of, of Romans chapter 8, Paul assured them that that they, even though they may be knocked down, they're never going to be knocked out. And so by careful examination of this passage, we too can gain the assurance of knowing that our victory has been secured, even in the most threatening situations. And so just like Ben Matlock would, would look at his defendants and he would see their good and he was ready to fight for their freedom, we too have Christ on our side who looks at us even when the world is judging us, even when we're ready to give up on ourselves because of what we're going through, and he's reminding us that we don't have to fight for the victory because we already have the victory. And so because he doesn't condemn us, but he knows and he's already proclaimed our innocence, he lays out this defense which will ultimately lead to our victory. And so, and that victory is not only secured by who Christ is, but what Christ does for us. And that brings me to my first point today, and that is that our victory is secured by the labor of Christ. I want you to write that in the comment section while you're listening to this. Our victory is secured by the labor of Christ. And so Paul starts off with this, this first uh, of a series of questions in verse 31, and he asks, what then shall we say to these things? Well, what things are you talking about? Well, he's talking about the things that are mentioned in the first part of uh, Romans chapter 8. He's talking about uh, the condemnation that's mentioned in verses 1 through 4, defeat that's mentioned in verses 5 through 17, and the discouragement that he talks about in verses 18 through 30. When, we, when all of these things seem insurmountable in our lives, what can we say to those things? Well, he gives us our answer, and that answer is, if God is for us, then who can be against us? And so now when we look at, at the verbiage Paul used, he says, if God is for us. But this if that he's using is not the if of possibility. He's not questioning whether or not God is for us, but more or less he, he is stating that God is in fact on our side. And that word in the Greek, it, it translates to mean since. So what Paul is actually saying is that since God is for us, who can be against us? And since God is on our side, you and I, we can walk in victory every day through every circumstance of our life. We need to enter each day and we need to go through each situation in life realizing that God is for us and regardless of who or what may be against us, we still have the victory. Now, now Paul isn't saying that we, we won't have adversaries along this journey. He's not saying that Satan won't attack us. He's, saying, he's not saying that the world won't be against us. He's not even saying that sometimes we won't be doubting in our own hearts. But what Paul is, is saying, he's saying that regardless of who your opponent is, in the face of the big God that we serve, your opponent is very small. If you're a born-again, blood-bought believer, God is always for you no matter what happens. There's no need for us to fear because God desires only the best for his children, even when we have to go through trials to receive those blessings from him. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans of, of 
welfare, we have the English Standard Version and in the New King James Version, it says thoughts of peace and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And now the implication here is, is that if, if anyone was able to rob us of our salvation, if anyone was able to, to, to steal the joy that we claim that we have, then he would have to be greater than God himself. Because God is both the giver and the sustainer of our salvation. But not only is he for, is he for us, and is he interested in us, and that's seen by the fact that he loved us before time began, and he formulated this plan to bring us to himself. But that interest has led him to make an investment to each and every one of us. And that's mentioned in verse 32. God loves the sinner so much that he gave his son to die on the cross for our sins. God made the ultimate investment in both you and me. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is not only the foundation of our salvation, but it's the foundation of our security. Because the Father loves us so much while we, while we were under condemnation, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And because he's given us this most precious gift, what makes us think that he won't give us all things, including the victory over the circumstances that we face in our lives? And then Paul continues and, and he finishes this, this first round of questions in verse 33 by, by asking, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? He, he wants us to know, or, or he's asking, who has the right to say that you are guilty before God? And, and what he's trying to say, and he mentions this in verse 30 of, of chapter 8, he says, if God has justified you, then who can successfully bring charges against you and find you guilty? Paul wants to know who has this right. The short answer, no one. You see, the world sees us who claim to know Jesus. They see how we live our lives now. They can remember how we lived our lives before we were saved. And they see these characteristics of our old life. You see, saints, people are watching everything that you do. They see you, they see how you live your life, they see that you claim to be saved, and, and they want to see if, if the tongue in your shoe is matching the tongue in your mouth. Are you walking the walk that you claim you have? And if that is the case, are you doing and are you walking the way God wants you to walk? As God's children, we ought to live lives that are different than those out in the world. And so Paul's, Paul's point, however, is that, that no one has the right to, to try and place anything on our account before the Lord. Not even the devil himself has the right to accuse the redeemed of sin before the Lord. Why? I'm glad you asked. Because when, when we were trusted with the salvation from Jesus, God justified us. And, and he didn't just take our sins away, but he declared us to be righteous. He took, he took all of the sin that was on my account and he placed it into the account of Jesus. And then he took the spotless righteousness that was in the account of Jesus and he applied it to my account. And on that basis, we've been declared right with God. You see, there, there, there are times, if we're going to be real and we're going to keep it 100, that there, there are times when we don't always act saved. And, and, and if a lost person were to be, be watching our walk, they might conclude that we are just as wicked as they are. But what they can't always see is that transaction that took place in heaven one day and that every child of God is as righteous as we will ever be. One of these days, our flesh is going to be changed. But until that happens, we're still declared just by the power of God. And we still have to walk the righteous walk. We are secure. We have the victory because God says we have the victory. But not only is our, is our victory secured by the labor or the work of Christ, but it's also secured by the life of Christ. 
And so when we look at verse 34, we're asked another very important question related to this matter of our security. Paul asked, who is he who condemns? Or, or more plainly stated, he said, can anyone point a finger at a redeemed sinner and then condemn them to hell? It, it's, it's almost like we're, we're, we're sitting in a, in a courtroom. And, and so we're, we're in the defendant's chair and, and, and this question is posed and you have Satan over at the persecution persecutor's table and, and he's throwing out any and every argument to say why we should be condemned, why we should be found guilty. And Paul comes back and he tells the believer why we can never be found guilty. And that answer is Jesus. But the first thing we see is, is that we can't be guilty because, because of the price that Jesus paid on the cross. Who has the right to condemn us when it was Christ who died for us? Again, the short answer, nobody. His death on the cross, it took care of the sin that of every person who will ever accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And since he died and paid the price, no one else has the right or the power to judge you or judge me. But not only that, it, it, it's the power that Jesus displayed at the tomb. You see, three days after Christ died on the cross, he left the tomb forever and he rose from the dead with all power and today he still lives. And the fact that he lives should give you and me hope for the future. But we should also know that that same power that brought him back from the dead is the same power that's working in our lives today to put away the sins. And, and not only is it the, the, the price that, that Christ paid or the power that was displayed, but it's also the position that he currently holds. You see, after Jesus was resurrected, he, he ascended back to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for both you and me. He, he's serving as our advocate or our representative before the Father in heaven. And that, that word advocate, it, it refers to one who pleads the case of another before the court of law. And in the courtroom of heaven, Satan is accusing the redeemed, but Jesus, the advocate, is defending us before the Father. And the Father always dismisses the case because the crimes have already been paid for. You see, in our legal system today, there's this concept called double jeopardy. And so what that means is when a defendant is pronounced not guilty or they're given a pardon for a particular crime or offense, they can never be held accountable for that same crime. And, and, and at times it seems like Satan is attempting to, to place us in a spiritual double jeopardy. He, he tries to paralyze us with the guilt of these sins that, that we feel or, or these thoughts that we have and these things that we've gone through. He, he attempts to bring defeat by convincing us that we're unfit for spiritual battle. Satan again will try to knock us down with the burden of these accusations, but he never will knock us out because of the forgiveness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because Christ lives, no one has the right to accuse us before the throne of God. No one has the right to judge the redeemed sinner. And this is just one more reason why you cannot lose your salvation. And it's why I believe that if you are truly saved, you are eternally saved. Jesus Christ is in heaven praying for you and for me and interceding for us to the Father. You see, right now, our, our salvation, it's not dependent on how good you are or how good I am. Our salvation and, our, and the security of our salvation, they're bound up in Jesus and him interceding for us in heaven. And if he's praying for you, if Jesus is praying for you, then there is no thing and there is no one that can make him stop interceding for you and for me. Who can condemn us? Nobody can. And since no one can judge us and Christ has already redeemed us through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, we are further secured in our salvation and our victory because, again, we know that there's nothing that can destroy us. But not only do we know that our victory is secured by, by the labor of Christ and by the life of Christ, but it's also secured by the love of Christ. And so when we look at Romans 8, verses 31 through 34, Paul proved that, that God cannot fail us. But the question then becomes, well, is it possible that we can fail him? 
And in these final verses, in verses 35 through 39, we, we move into some circumstances of life that would cause us problems and trouble. He tells us that what sin and Satan could not do, even the terrible situations of life, can't and should not take away our security and our victory or cause us to turn away from the love of Christ. You see, in verses 35 and 36, we see that it says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Paul reminds us that we have this, this undefeatable motivation for victory, and that motivation is the love of God. We're undefeatable because there's nothing that can separate us from him. And then he quotes a, a verse from the 44th Psalms where, where he's pointing out that those who love God, we, we've always had to fight death daily. We always have things coming our way trying to take us out. And when they talk about separating us from the love of God, that, that, that means to place, place a wedge between what was, and, and, and it was all also used as a synonym for amputate. So it means to physically cut it off of what it belongs to. And so what he's saying is there, there is nothing that can get in the way of God loving us. We will never be cut off from Christ no matter what we go through. And regardless of what we face in life, there, there is nothing that, come that can come between us and the love of God because his love will endure through anything. You see, we can't get caught up in the things that happen in life and we can't feel like God, God is forsaking us or God, God has, has left us. But when we face the, these troubles within or these hardships without, none of those things can remove us from the Savior. None of those things can break the bond that we have between God. And those who are persecuted for their faith must never be severed from the love. He loves us and he's promised us that he will be there with us until the end. Regardless of, of what happens in your life, there, there's nothing that, that man can do to you. There's no situation that, that can happen to you that can cause you to come between what you have with God. His love endures all and that enduring love should make us feel even more secure. And then when we look at verse 37, Paul declares that, that we should not just be surviving through these things, but we should be thriving in these things. You see, we aren't just called to cope with the situations of life. We're called to be, be conquerors. In, in fact, we're called to be more than conquerors. And so the, 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 the Greek word here that they use for more than, than conqueror, it comes from the word upernikeo which translates to super conqueror or one who overwhelmingly is victorious. And so we, we don't need to fear life, life or death or the things that are coming at us. We don't need to fear principalities or powers. We don't need to fear height nor depth nor any created thing. We don't need to fear COVID-19 or the circumstances that have presented itself with it. We don't need to fear the threat of police brutality or the injustices that we seemingly encounter every day. Why? Because Christ lives within us and his love enables us to stand against everything and conquer it all. You see, the, the, the genuine believer proves that he's real by the life he lives. If the things of this world, if, if those things mentioned in verse 35, if they can come between us and, and, and us living for God, then we probably weren't saved in the beginning. If, if, a, if a professing Christian can walk away from the things of God and live in persistent sin, that person didn't lose their salvation. That person never had salvation in the first place. True biblical salvation will produce an endurance in your life and in my life and in all the lives of the saints of God. True children of God, we're, we're enabled by the prevailing love of God to carry on until he calls us home to glory. We can never be conquered and we can never be defeated. And so verse 35 poses the question about us being conquered due to our constant battles with the flesh and with the world and with Satan. And, and then in verses, the latter part of 35 and verse 36, 
it talks about the, the, the promise of a trying journey. But then in verse 37, we're left with this promise of a triumphant journey. And that victory is overwhelming through him who loves us and him who keeps us. And so then Paul closes the chapter by speaking of his confidence in his own security and in that of the redeemed. He says in verse 38 and 39, he, he says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's saying there was absolutely nothing that would come and separate him from God. And he tells us that, that this is not just a, a, a hope type thing, something that we should just wish happens, but he's telling us that we can be confident in knowing this. He tells us that there's nothing from the beginning of our life with God until the end of our life that will be able to separate us from the salvation we enjoy through Christ Jesus. And, and, at, the, and at the end of this, the result will be blessed assurance that in Jesus we are forever protected and we're secure regardless what comes our way. When the, when the COVID situation first, first started and, and the stay-at-home orders were, were, were given, um, all of the live sports had started to be canceled. Uh, and so ESPN had started showing reruns of, of, of various sporting events. And so one day I was flipping through the channels and, and I saw Game 7 of the 2016 NBA Finals. And since I had nothing else to watch, I, I decided to watch this game. LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers versus Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors. And so as the, as the game went on, I find myself getting more and more involved and more and more anxious with, with each play. Now, I'm an NBA fan and I'm a LeBron fan, so I knew that the Cavs were going to win the game and they were going to win the series, but I found myself getting upset when the Cavs would turn the ball over. I found myself getting mad when the Golden State Warriors took the lead, and with each passing second, I could feel my heart beating a little bit faster and a little bit harder until the clock struck zero, and when it sounded, the Cavs had won. But I already knew how the game was going to turn out. And the way I was watching that game is, is the same way a lot of Christians live our lives. We go through each day, we go through each situation, each trial, each tribulation, often getting discouraged by what happens. But in each circumstance, in each bad situation, we know how the game ends. When we are, when we are truly blood-bought, born-again Christians, we know that we're going to win. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we know that we're going to go through some trials and tribulations. Sometimes we're going to fumble away opportunities. Sometimes we're going to lose some battles. And yes, sometimes it's going to seem like Satan has taken the lead in the game. But God. Romans 8 is it's a wonderful chapter that shows us Christians that we will be victorious. You see, we're free from, from, from judgment because Christ died for us and we have his righteousness. We're free from fear because Christ intercedes for us and we cannot be separated from his love. And we're free from defeat because Christ lives in us and his spirit, we share his life. You see, our victory has been, been firmly secured because of Christ, his labor, his life, and his love. In studying this sermon, my, my, my heart kept going to, to this song that, that our praise team sings quite often. And, and, it, and it says, who will stand against the Lord? No one can. No one will. Who will stand against the King? No one can. No one will. Why? Because the victory belongs to Jesus. The victory belongs to him. And then later on in the songs, it, it, it says, you will deliver. You're a provider. I find my victory in you. Forever victorious. 
forever will win, I find my victory in you. We live in a world that, 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 that seems to be spiraling out of control. And it's a world where, where nothing seems certain. But even in all of this uncertainty, we have one great assurance. And that assurance is that God is faithful. And as long as God is faithful, the things of this world will knock us down, but they'll never knock us out. Why? Because God is with us. He loves us. And there's nothing that can separate us from him and his love. Let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious Father, we thank you for everything that you've done for us, Father. We just thank you for, for your love and your grace and your mercy, Father. Just continuing to be with us as we, we go through each day, Father. Father, we're living in a time where things seem uncertain and we don't know what tomorrow may bring, Father. But we know that as long as you are at the head, Father, we know that everything will be all right and we'll be victorious in the end, Father. So we ask that you just enter into our hearts, Father. Give us the, the, the calmness that we need to, to go through each situation in life, Father, knowing that regardless of what trial or tribulation may come our way, we're going to make it out on you. We're going to make it out all right. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. What a powerful, powerful word from God. We thank God so much uh, for the message this morning and for the messenger. Uh, thank you, Elder Jeremy, for teaching us God's word today. Um, listen, uh, three points this morning, three powerful points that let us know that we have the victory in Christ. We have victory through uh, through his labor and we have victory through his life and we have victory, uh, amen, through his love. So we're grateful for that today. If you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have victory in Christ, you're in the right place today. We love uh, to be able to share with you more about what it means to be a child of God, uh, what it means to be justified, declared in the courtroom of heaven, just as if I'd never sinned. Uh, I mean, that is the greatest news that the world uh, could ever hear, that we can be justified by faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we want you to have that assurance today, that blessed assurance in these uncertain times. And so you can have that. Um, if you sense in your heart today that God is drawing uh, you to himself through faith in Christ, we'd love to walk with you in that journey. Give us a call um, at Belfair Church at area code 225 three five five nine eight seven zero um or reach out to us here send us an inbox on facebook message us on youtube um or send us an email at info at belfairchurch.org also if you're looking for a church home to uh to be involved in. Uh, we'd love to have you at Belfair Church. Belfair Church is a, a church believing the gospel, belonging uh, to community, becoming like Jesus and building the kingdom of God. And so we'd love to have you to partner with us in the work that God has called us to do in this season. Uh, again, send us a message and we'd love to hear from you and to connect uh, with you. Um, until then, remember, I love you and there's nothing, absolutely nothing that you can do about it. Have a blessed week. Thank <laughs> you.